Now, sometimes you hear it kind of slightly ridiculed. Um, all these declarations are popping out like popcorn. You know, this declaration of the priests in Vienna in 2012 when we were there with Father Ringrose, the declaration of Father Ringrose, declaration of this priest, declaration of that priest. And some of the people say, well, this is ridiculous. But it's not really ridiculous. Why? Because we are in a state of war, we're in a state of terrible crisis. And Archbishop Lefebvre said that all the faithful have a right to know where their priests stand. They have a right to know where they stand on Vatican II, on the new mass, on Bishop Fillet's new direction. And they need to know if they're going to follow and go to Mass and keep their faith. Just like very similar to the times in Mexico during the persecution, in France during the persecution, people asked their priests, where do you stand on this? Did you take the oath? Did you take the oath in France, which accepted the Masonic ideas of separation of church and state and um, the down with the monarchy policy? And if they signed it, the Catholic people wouldn't go to their Mass. And take note, it wasn't a new Mass facing the people with altar girls. It was the traditional Latin Mass. But they would not go because those priests made the oath and betrayed the faith, compromised the faith. Same within England during the persecution. The people asked their priests, are you going with Henry VIII and Elizabeth's new religion? And if they said, well, you know, I have to... I have to have life insurance, I have to have my medical insurance, what do you expect? It can't be too radical, sorry. But the priests who came were hunted down like animals, like Father John Gerard and St. John Southwell and Father Robert Southwell and Father St. Edmund Campion. They were going from house to house, hunted down like animals. And I've told this story many times, but it's really interesting is the fact that in England, only about, what was it, 15, 20 years ago, a construction crew was in an old home renovating. And they were clearing out several, you know, there's many stories to these old homes, and they were clearing out one of the top stories and broke into a hiding place, because many of the priests were kept in hiding places that were built to hide the priests. And uh, open brackets, that's why Dr. David Allen White, he has a, a very big suspicion, conclusive suspicion, that that's why Shakespeare put a curse on his own grave, that anyone who dugs up, digs up his grave will be cursed. Because he died probably with Catholic medallions and, and crucifix. And to save his family, if they found out later that he was Catholic, they would persecute his family. So he forbade anybody to dig up his grave. And so uh, Dr. Alan White concludes that it's very probable that the father of Shakespeare also ha held priests in his house. And if you had priests, you could be arrested, you could be also uh, fined heavily, or uh, in many cases executed. <clears throat> by the guillotine or hanging. Close brackets. So uh, what happened? This, this work crew broke into the hiding place and they saw a priest sitting up against the wall, a skeleton, sitting in his vestments with a ciborium in his hand. And the flesh all rotted, but the ciborium was in his hands. And they, you know, imagine if you were a work crew and you broke into this. So they just stepped back and they called the local Catholic bishop and he came and uh, he took the ciborium and opened it and found the hosts, the few hosts that were left in there were still perfectly intact. And that's since, what, um, mid to late 1500s. And this was, this was within 25 years ago. So, <clears throat> So why, a good guess would be that priest was saying Mass. The Protestant jailers came. That priest, they hid him quickly. They took everything about Mass 
hid it all and put it away, but they found something, candlesticks, chalice, whatever it was, and they arrested the whole family. The whole family was taken away, and no one ever could come back to open the door or the secret latch to unleash the priest. So he resigned himself to God's will and probably just starved to death, taking one host per day to live on the sacred host. So that's probably what happened. So, um, and in Mexico also, the, pre the people would not go to the Mass if the priest that jurored, that made the oath, siding with the Freemasonry. And same in Hungary, the Pax priests, Archbishop Lefebvre spoke about them quite often. These priests that agreed to, to not condemn from the pulpit communism. That's all they had to promise. And they signed the promise. They were called the Pax priests. But Cardinal Mazzenti, as you know, he didn't sign that. And he continued to preach against communism from the pulpit. And they warned him, they threatened him. And he said one day, the, I think it was the last Sunday before he was arrested, if you hear me say anything against Opposite to what I've said, don't believe me from prison, because I have been drugged. And so, uh, sure enough, he was arrested in the middle of the night, taken away. He was in prison for 14 years. Where were all the other bishops? Where were all the other priests? So, that's why there's so many declarations, because as each priest steps forward, they have to say where they stand on this whole issue. And the, the faithful have a right to know. They have a right to know. And that's why if a priest can't give clear answers and uh, make a clear stand, then there's a question mark. Okay, so here's the text of it. And, uh, well, I, I, it's, I don't want to take too much time, but here I'll hit, I'll hit the main parts. Faithful to the heritage of Archbishop Lefebvre, and in particular to his memor memorable declaration of November 21st, 1924, excuse me, 1974. So that was, last November 21st would have been, how many years since this? 40 years. Bishop Fillet, in his, in his letter written on November 21st, 2014, you would expect you know, a big tribute, a big honor given to the declaration of Archbishop Lefebvre, which he wrote 40 years to the day. That letter that he wrote completely ignored it, and on, in fact praised Pope Benedict XVI as being um, as for his prophetic wisdom. So, that says a lot too. Many times people say many things not by what they say, but what they admit to say. And that's a huge omission, that one. So, I continue. And this is published by the Dominicans of Avrié, and you can see their new English website. It's very well done. Just look up, I think, Dominicans of Avrié USA or something. We adhere with all our hearts and all our souls to Catholic Rome the keeper of the Catholic faith and the traditions that are necessary to the preservation of this faith and to eternal Rome, the mistress of wisdom and truth. So a lot of this declaration is just a repeat of 1974, okay? And uh, notice, what's the <coughs> distinction with Rome? What's the, what's the distinction Archbishop Lefebvre always made with Rome? Yeah, we follow Rome. Yes, we obey Rome. But the Rome of what and the Rome of what? Yeah, we stay with Catholic Rome, but we refuse what? The Rome of Vatican II, the Conciliar Rome, Modernist Rome. Bishop Fillet no longer makes that distinction. It's gone. It's gone. And he really thinks, and Father Pfluger, <laughs> Father Pfluger is kind of like the Cardinal Ratzinger of the SSPX. He just says it as it is. We're going to Rome. If you don't want to come, get off the train. Father Nelly said that too. And Father Pfluger, who's the right-hand first assistant to Bishop Follet, he said, referring to the SSPX, we are in an abnormal situation and we have to get back with Rome. Now Archbishop Lefebvre would say, that's childish speak. Because what Rome are you talking about? 
Catholic Rome? Yes, we want that. But, but they're not Catholic right now, and we have to just hold on until we have a Catholic Pope. Modernist Rome? No way. But Father Pfluger and Bishop Follet and Father Nelly, the leaders up there, they, they now really are convinced we are in a truly abnormal situation. We are canonically not recognized, and uh, we have to get back to normal. So it's kind of like the Israelites who want to be like all the other nations. They want to have, they don't want to have God leading them anymore. They want to have a real king. And they complained about this to God. And God told Moses, just step aside, Moses. Let me destroy these people. And Moses fell flat on his face before the altar of God. And he prayed and, and said, Lord, but remember, you led these people out of Israel, out of Egypt. You fed them. Remember the promise you made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so God was, his heart was softened, thank God, and he had mercy, as will happen many times. So um, this, this, this false to, failure to make the right distinctions in this crisis is deadly. Um, so I read on. Following the example of the great prelate, the intrepid defender of the church and of the apostolic seat, we categorically refuse and we have always refused to follow the, the neo-modernist and neo-protestant Rome. That has clearly manifested itself in the Vatican Council II and since then in all the reforms and orientations issuing from it. The reforms and orientations have in fact contributed and continue to contribute to the renewal of the church, to the building up of the church, no, to the demolition of the church, to the loss of her missionary spirit, to the spread of indifferentism by means of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, to the destruction of the priesthood, to the denial of the sacrifice and of the sacraments, to the weakening of the pontifical authority, to theological anarchy, to disordered pastoral approaches, <coughs> to the disappearance of religious life, to naturalistic and Tehardian teaching in universities, seminaries, and catechisms. A teaching issuing from liberalism and Protestantism, both of which were condemned time and time again by the solemn magisterium of the Church. And so that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, you know, remember when he was excommunicated and he was labeled a disobedient and rebellious, and, and all the media was on him. And uh, he was asked by some interviewer, don't you feel alone being the only bishop? Don't you feel a little awkward? And the archbishop said, I have all of the saints, I have all the popes of tradition in heaven behind me. I have our Lord with me. What do I need to feel alone for? And believe me, he was a rock. Archbishop Lefebvre was just... <coughs> if there was only one altar boy and uh, four bishops or three or two and a few pack of crickets, he would still have gone through with the consecration of bishops back in 88. And I, I had the happiness to be there as well. And uh, of course, 10,000 people showed up and all the full support of the priests and... Uh, and uh, Rome was furious. <clears throat> they didn't want it to happen. And as you know, they called Bishop Lefebvre the night before <coughs> Rome and said, look, we've got a big limousine to pick you up. Come on down to Rome and we'll discuss. But he's been trying to discuss and discuss and discuss and no, no getting anywhere with doctrine. So had he taken that limousine ride, how many of you think he might have made it down back to Rome? <laughs> there might have been a freak accident, you know. And that is why Bishop Williamson wisely waited for Bishop Father Ford to arrive at the monastery in Brazil before he consecrated and made it public. He waited for both of them to be there at the monastery before he made it public because there could have been another freak accident which has happened to, it's happening a lot in the secular world. Like the Navy SEALs, the whole helicopter that went down a few years ago. That's very fishy. 
Uh, no authority, not even the highest authority in the hierarchy, can force us to abandon or to diminish our Catholic faith. No pope, no bishop can make us lose our faith. And that's why we have a right to say to Bishop Follet, you don't have the right to compromise the faith and overthrow what our founder laid down to keep the faith. So clearly expressed and professed both by the magisterium of the church and for the past 20 centuries and in more recent times. In key documents dealing with anti-liberal and anti-modernist doctrine, notably the following, Mirari Vos by, Benedict, by Pope Gregory XVI, Quanta Cura and the Syllabus of Errors by Pius IX, Immortali Dei and Libertas by Leo XIII, Pascendi by Pius X, including the anti-modernist oath, Quas Primas and Mortali Marimos by Pius XI, and Humani Generis by Pius XII. These encyclicals I just na named off, Try to read them, especially you men. They're not that difficult. Uh, Pescendi's meat and potatoes, that one is. And even the modernists will say to their students, if you don't really know what we're trying to say, what modernism is, here, read Pascendi. This explains it better than we do. So, uh, uh, so these encyclicals all condemn Vatican II. So if Vatican II stands up against these infallible encyclicals, who do we follow? If Vatican II opposes all these, who do we stay with? The popes of tradition or Vatican II? Do we follow Pope Francis who promotes Vatican II and Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul II and Pope Paul VI? Do we follow them and go against all of Catholic tradition or do we or do we go against Catholic tradition and appear disobedience, but to stay faithful to tradition? Obviously, obviously, to go against Vatican II and the reigning pontiff, you're going to be labeled disobedient, schismatic, rebellious, dissident, and so many other adjectives. And now they're adding a few more with the resistance. But who cares? Who really cares? We're not here to please men, but to please God. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, you men who stand up for the faith, your children and your great-grandchildren, if the world goes that long, they're going to say, Dad, Grandpa kept the faith. He was great because he kept the faith. And that's where any greatness comes, is, is to keep the faith. In God's eyes, that's all that matters. And uh, So, St. Paul says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. And the apostle repeats, as we said before, so now I say again, if anyone preach to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. Bishop Fillet is now promoting a new gospel. It's called a watered-down Vatican II, looking at it in the light of tradition. And you just can't do that. That is the hermeneutics of Benedict XVI which is to, to so interpret Vatican II, squeeze out as much juice you can get of, of tradition out of it. But you can, take, you can take Martin Luther's writings and squeeze out a lot of Catholicism, but it's the whole that makes it poison, you see. Therefore, if words or actions of the Pope are actions of the Roman dicasteries openly contradict traditional doctrine, we then choose that which was always taught, and we turn a deaf ear to, to novelties that are destructive to the church and to the very hermeneutic that pretends to demonstrate that there is a continuity between the novelties and the constant magisterium of the past centuries. So that's why uh, Pope, our Bishop Fillet was kind of enamored with Pope Benedict XVI as he appeared all traditional and everything, and traditional vestments. And, but he, he is more of a snake than Pope Francis. At least Pope Francis wears his clown nose. At least he's a goofball and everybody sees it and knows it. But he's Pope. And he's an embarrassment to all of the history of the church. But Pope Benedict was a little more slick. He's like, you know, Obama should really be, if, to, if he dressed according to his ideas, he should have an afro three feet long. <laughs> he should have Bermuda shorts ripped up, blue jeans ripped up, 
uh, you know, those dangling leathers. <laughs> he should have earrings, tattoos, uh, goatee, and with a jukebox on his shoulder. Boombox. Boombox, whatever it is. <laughs> and he should, that's how he should be dressing. If he dressed according to his ideas, just revolution. But see, we're in a new phase of the war politically as well, because you got, I mean, he's just a suit and a tie, he's clean cut, he's shaven, there's no earrings. And he can, he can hold a sentence. He sat with Putin, did you ever see that video? Look up Brother Nathaniel, any of you. Brother Nathaniel, he is, he's really good. He, he's a Jewish convert, he's, a, he's an Orthodox priest, but he doesn't pull any punches. So he's pretty good. And, and he showed a video of Putin sitting with Obama. And Obama's trying to strike a conversation. And Obama's got all this blood of abortions off his hands. And he's, he's passing all communist socialized medicine. He's destroying our country. But it's not him. It's, it's the Judeo Masons behind him. He's just their puppet. But there's Putin, and he's just a Russian stone. He's just sitting there doesn't even respond, doesn't even answer, and Obama's scratching his legs and wondering what to say. And, and Putin just, you know, he knows the hypocrisy, and he doesn't even consider it. So anyway, uh, so we are in a new stage of a revolution, but with Thai clean cut. So it looks conservative, it looks traditional, it looks old-fashioned, but it's not. It's complete revolution. And that's what's happening in the Catholic Church as well. You've got the return of more Latin Masses with Gregorian chant, but it's all new Mass. You've got more traditional vestments coming out. It's all more, a little more Latin singing, a little more in a sense here and there. And Pope Benedict XVI, but it's a revolution, complete revolution in their heads, Vatican II and the new Mass. So, um, anyway, it's a beautiful, long pr profession of the faith. And um, let me just conclude with the last couple points. It, it, it ends with a few requests. To declare, we ask that the, Saint, the, the successor of Peter, the Pope, declare that he firmly upholds, in the same sense as did his predecessors, the doctrine of Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, Pope Pius the Ninth, Leo the Thirteenth, Pius the Tenth, Pius the Eleventh, and Pius the Twelfth, and that the Pope denounces the errors of the liberal culture by denouncing false religious liberty and the false rights of man without God. The Pontiff would thus reaffirm the social kingship of Christ. So the, this declaration ends by asking the Pope profess the faith of his predecessors. Reestablish the anti-modernist oath prescribed in 1910 and which was abrogated in 1967 and require it for all the clergy and professors. Thirdly, by invoking the privilege of papal infallibility, we ask the pontiff, the pope, to solemnly condemn Vatican II and its documents which are contrary to the irrevocable definitions of the previous magisterium. This would revoke the falsely assumed authority of a pastoral council, a new Pentecost in the church, which 50 years later has proved to be the greatest disaster in the history of the church. So this is ending with requests to the Pope, teach the faith like you're supposed to, do your duty, condemn Vatican II, and finally, in order to obtain peace in the world, we also respectfully implore Pope Francis to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary according to the demands of heaven made at Fatima and in the correct form as requested. And this being done with God's grace and with the assistance of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph and St. Pius X, we trust that we will remain united to the one holy Catholic, apostolic, and Roman Church, as well as the successors of St. Peter, and that we will faithfully spread far and wide the mysteries of our Lord Jesus Christ in Spiritus Santo. So that was given a uh, Feast of Christ the King, October 26, 2014. That was written by the uh, Dominican Fathers in France. <clears throat> so it's, it's a little longer. I'm just shortening it because I have to drive up to Nickelville. Father, 
Excuse me. Yes. So the greenhouse, uh, 1230, we have to be out of here with everything put back at 1 o'clock. Yeah, okay, yeah. We're going to finish real soon here. Thanks, Al. Uh, well, does Resistance Priest sign this also, or? Uh, this is mainly out of out of Dominican Zimbabwe, but we, if we could sign it, we would sign it. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned uh, Father McDonald. I'm trying to, there's two Father McDonalds. I don't know there's three. One. Three. Right. Which one is this that joined with you? Uh, Father Ed McDonald and Steve and Dennis are, are younger. Steve and Dennis McDonald are younger priests. Is this the, the one that was out to St. Mary's for so many years? This one yeah, was? this is Ed. Father Ed McDonald. Yeah, I know him. Okay. Father Ed McDonald. Who was the other priest? The other McDonald's or Stephen? No, no, no. Oh, the other priest that joined the resistance? I forget his name. <clears throat> he says, I think he was in Ireland. I forget his name. But, but uh, you know, pray. Pray for Father Standish. You know, he knows better. He studied with me, with Bishop Williamson. He knows <clears throat> modernists speak double-tongued. He knows you're not supposed to swallow Vatican II at all. He knows you can't make an agreement with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. He knows all this. He knows all this. But pray for him because, uh, you know, if he does anything against the, the mainstream, he'll have his head cut off. But big deal. You lose your head, well, life goes on. You're just going <laughs> there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of following the party line. Everyone is moved by fear. You all know about the account of Stalin. Um, uh, Stalin's name was mentioned, and, and this was during the communist <coughs> reign of Stalin. <clears throat> and there was a standing ovation for Stalin. And the ovation just... You know, they last usually, what, 15, 20 seconds, a minute at most. And this one over a minute and a half. And everybody's still clapping. And two minutes, they're still clapping. And they start saying, this is getting ridiculous. But they kept clapping because the police were looking for the first to stop clapping. Mark them and number them, and they'll be dead within 24 hours. It was fear that reigned. You had to follow the, follow the flow. And that is what's happening now in our dear priestly society in Pius X, the new one. There's a grip of fear. And, you know, the priests don't dare to go against the new policy because they will be axed. And that's why, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but that's why I, I think you know, John Minari does a good job with Catholic Family News. And John Minari is a great man. I know him well, <clears throat> and he really has, he loves the faith. And, but uh, right now, <laughs> he's kind of caught. Because if he says anything in favor of the resistance, the SSPX Marian Corps, and then anything in favor of Bishop Williamson or Bishop Four, the SSPX will cut him off so fast, they'll close his publications from all the bookstores, and he'll be in the streets begging or not some money. But no, St. Joseph will take care of him. He just has to do the right thing. And God will take care of him. <laughs> Pius X said that too. Good Catholic presses should tell the truth fearlessly. But he has never touched the subject. <laughs> but now he has to. Bishop Four is consecrated. He has to put that article. If it's Catholic news for Catholic families, they better know about this. So he's kind of on a... He's kind of a... No, pray for him. <laughs> to have strength, to just do what he should. But anyway, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, any uh, questions anyone might have, try to read the new recusant. It's very good. And uh, there's a new publication that's come out since January called The Catholic Candle. It's a little bit, it's a little bit nitpicking, you might argue. Maybe, maybe, because we don't, we're not standing about Anything but doctrine is the key thing. This, this gets into a little, to a little more doctrine. It kind of, kind of uh, says, you know, it kind of gets on the seminary for uh, selling a, a new car to raise money. You know, that's not the end of the world. 
but they really do, they do need money because many people are, lo are abandoning the SSPX chapels. And they're not going to the resistance. They're going back to the Navasoto Mass or to the Navasoto Motu Proprio Masses. Because, hey, if Bishop Filet wants to go back with Rome, what are we waiting for? And two society priests, priors, both of them French, one in France and one in India, left their priories with their luggage, a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and said, if we're going to Rome, what are we waiting for? And they went back to the, no went back. They went to the Novus Ordo. Wow. To the Novus Ordo. And now they're saying Novus Ordo Masses, and they have their pension, and their, their health insurance, and, and they can have that. We'd rather die starving with the faith than have a castle to live in, well fed and well slept, but not the faith, our compromise. Any questions? <clears throat> I have a question, as much as a comment. You see, you know, the arguments that are being made all the time about so-called agreement, we're almost smarter than that, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. We're not going to have an agreement. And, and, and to argue that, that's kind of a litmus test for people sitting on the edge waiting to see, but it's not going to happen. What they need to understand, what the argument really should be, is that just like with Vatican II and the Adjournamento and, and, and that that happened, it's already happened in the late 90s. So this, what we're seeing now, is a result of that, just like what we saw in the late 60s and 70s was a result of what happened with that, those agreements, the House politics and, and whatnot. So, you know, if we keep focusing on the agreement, which I think Rome, just like they did, they changed, you know, they, after all the discussions, they came back with something that they knew he couldn't accept, they don't want the agreement. They know that just by holding the carrot out there and keeping people coming along, slowly they'll, they'll be deceived and they'll become, you yeah. know, and uh, so it's just something to keep in mind when the arguments are made, especially when you read, read some of these forms and the arguments are made. Uh, yeah. You know, you're dealing, anyways. Bishop Filet is dealing with some slick Freemasons. Yeah. And these are high up Masons dressed in purple and red, maybe white. And uh, they are smart. They are smooth. They are smooth. Uh, uh, yes. You mentioned in your sermon about uh, this film that was done by Father Bromo. What was the name of it again? And where could it be seen? Yeah, that was back in '86. The film is called A Sign of Hope. A Sign of Hope. We used to jokingly call it A Sign of Despair <clears throat> because <laughs> at the time it was a film, you know, homemade film. And, kind of cheesy, you would say. <clears throat> but look at it again, and compare it to all the new SSPX videos that are coming out. Just compare the two. And one might be cheesy, but it's got the hardcore Catholic doctrine. Where do we find it? Just look up internet, uh, YouTube, a sign of hope, but it's the picture with the two seminarians in the garden working. And it's really well done. It's, 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 it's the old SSPS, you know, we're in war, we got to fight, period. Yes? <clears throat> what is the canonical authority of Bishop Filet as far as superior general? What does that exactly mean? It means a little more or about the same as being president of the Holy Name Society. <laughs> he, he didn't really have the authority. Right. To, None of, no, yeah. He has no authority to expel Bishop Williamson right. or to declare him, well, he didn't declare him excommunicate. He wouldn't be that dumb <laughs> because he has no authority. And they have no jurisdiction. They all know that. And, and in fact, when I had mass in, uh, in Vanita with, in Oregon, uh, you know, one of the parishioners came up and said, you have no right to come into the jurisdiction of Father Perfect. And I said, well, Father Perfect has as much jurisdiction as I do to come and say Mass and take care of souls, because he has zero jurisdiction. And every single society, mission, priory, school, confession, Mass, is without jurisdiction, officially, because these modernists and these modernist popes won't give it. So he just seized power, basically. It's like a... It's time to go, Father. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's hope not. Okay, so persevere. We'll say a little prayer. I'll give you a blessing.